Hi, I'm Keith Ray de Candido, and this is a reading from Mermaid Precinct, the latest book in the Precinct series of fantasy police procedurals, which are published by the fine folks at eSpec Books. Uh, the first book is Dragon Precinct, it is followed by Unicorn Precinct, Goblin Precinct, Griffin Precinct, and the latest one, Mermaid Precinct. Uh, there's also a short story collection called Tales from Dragon Precinct, and I am currently hard at work on the next book, which is called Phoenix Precinct. This is Chapter 6. Of Mermaid Precinct. The first time Danthris Tresillian had seen the rising jewel, she'd been a child in Sorlin. She'd been standing on the cliffs that overlooked the Garamon Sea with her adoptive sister Lil, and the pair of them had watched in awe as this big, beautiful boat, topped by a foreboding black flag, appeared out of the fog and slowly settled in among the reefs. What is that? She'd asked, eyes wide with disbelief. It's a boat, Lil had replied with a twinkle in her eye. Very funny. I know that it's a boat. What's it doing there? Crashing and sinking if it's like every other boat that's tried to approach from the Garamond. Part of why Sorlin had been founded on the Cone Peninsula was due to its coastline being a cliff above rocky reefs that were death on small boats and very damaging to large, large ones. However, the rising jewel hadn't crashed or sunk, to Lil's surprise. Rowing, it tor rowing toward it now on the dinghy, approaching it directly from the sea, it loomed larger in Danthrus's vision than it had from atop the peninsula cliffs back then. As the dinghy approached, Danthrus suddenly felt a tingle all up and down her body. Her partner, Torin Van Wivelt, shivered, so he obviously felt it as well. What was that? Listen smiled. I told you the ship is quite heavily warded. Gazing at Danthrus, Torin said, If the wards are so intense that we're feeling them, I shudder to think how Benin would respond. Poorly. Danthrus was, if anything, understating it. The wizard Benin was cranky under the best of circumstances, and being confronted with wards of sufficient power that non-mages could feel them would be the worst of circumstances for him. Someone on the deck threw a rope ladder over the side, and it bounced off the hull with a thunk. Listen pointed at the ladder. After you, lieutenants. Torin shook his head. After you, I would say. Danthrus sighed. On the one hand, yes, this was a pirate ship, but Torin was taking his mistrust to an absurd extreme. He continued, I suspect that your shipmates will be far more comfortable having the first face onto the deck being a familiar one rather than two armed and armored members of the local law enforcement. At that, Danthrus relented. My partner is correct. Shrugging, listen, said, as you wish, I was merely attempting politeness. Hence our confusion. Torin grinned, a sight that still disconcerted Danthrus without a huge red beard surrounding it. We encounter very little of such in our line of work. Listen chuckled, nor do we. The sailing master climbed up the ladder, and Danthrus followed him up, Torin trailing behind her. As she climbed up onto the deck, Danthrus heard a deep voice say, I still think this is a stupid idea. Listen replied, We've already had this argument, Chamlin, and we agreed. They're here now, so let's let them do what they do best. Settling onto the deck, Danthrus turned and reached a hand out to Torin, guiding him onto the deck. They both turned as one to face a semicircle of pirates. Danthrus recognized a couple of faces, but most were strangers. It had been almost two decades, so it was more of a surprise that she knew any of them beyond listen. Though the deck was bucking and bouncing with the tide while the ship was anchored, they all stood steadily. Danthrus couldn't really stay the, say the same. She struggled to keep her footing, and she could see that Torin was having similar difficulties. At the center of the semicircle, which was effectively blocking the two detectives from actually going anywhere on the vessel, was a gnome with dark hair and a deep scowl. Pointing at the pair of them, Listen said to the gnome, These are the detectives, uh, Lieutenant Danthrus Tresillian and her partner, Torin Van Wivelt. Lieutenants, this is Chamblin, the quartermaster. Danthrus recalled that the quartermaster was the equivalent of the ship's first mate, the second in command after the pirate queen herself. When she was a girl, it was an old man whose name she couldn't recall now two decades on. Chamblin scoffed. They're thugs in armor. 
They're more than that, Listen said. Danthrus used to live in Sorlin, and I knew her then. So did the captain. And Lieutenant Ben Whittled is from Miverin. Miverin's full of shit suckers. Torin stepped forward, then stumbled. Danthrus grabbed his arm to keep him from falling to the deck. Thank you, he said to her, then looked back at Chamblin. I agree with that assessment, which is indeed why I left. Several of the pirates chuckled, though Chamblin, Danthrus noted, was not one of them. She wasn't sure if they were making light of their unsteadiness afoot, or Torrens rejoinder. The point, Liston said, is that he was raised there and attended the Collegium. I can vouch for Danthrus, and Ben Wivold's pedigree speaks for itself. And what will they tell us? That the captain's dead? We already know that. They'll tell us who did it, so he may be punished. I doubt that. In case your doubts prove fruitless, Danthrus said, we should see the body. For a moment, Danthrus feared that Chamblin would not allow the semicircle to be broken, and they'd be told to climb back down the ladder. Worse, Chamblin might do as Torin had feared and take them prisoner. He obviously didn't want them there, and his wishes would override those of Listen in theory, since he was now in charge. Torin then moved back toward the rope ladder, falling more than stepping to the railing and grabbing it for purchase. Come, Danthrus, it's obvious that our services are not required here. Where do you think you're going, shitsucker? Back to Cliff's End. I shouldn't be surprised that you don't wish our aid. After all, we serve the cause of justice, and I see very little of that in the lives you've chosen to lead. A susurrus of anger flew through the assembled pirates, and Chamblin's scowl deepened, an action Danthrus wouldn't have considered possible a moment earlier. One of the crew asked, You don't think we want justice for the captain? Well, I think some of you do. Enough to have overridden the wishes of this gnome, who obviously doesn't want us here. But that discussion has already been had, or Listen would never have come to fetch us in the first place. So I can only conclude that something has changed and that we are no longer needed or wanted. Therefore, Chamblin stepped forward. Stop! You really are from Mivering. You talk just like those shit suckers. He turned, nodded to the assembled pirates, and they all stepped away, returning to their duties. I agreed to let you find her killer, and I will abide by that agreement. But I have no intention of liking it. That last was said with a sneer at the sailing master. Listen, for his part, was completely unabashed, which Danthrus appreciated. Pointedly looking away from Shamblin, Listen said, Well, let's go. She's in her cabin. The two pirates led the way across the deck to a staircase below. Torin and Danthrus followed behind, holding on to whatever they could to keep from falling gracelessly to the deck. As they walked, Shamblin said, we first realized something was wrong when the captain didn't report for first watch. Captain always reports for first watch and is never late, Listen sighed. Or never was late, anyhow. The staircase and the corridor it emptied onto were barely narrow enough to accommodate the diminutive form of the quartermaster. Danthrus found she had to walk sideways in order to fit, and Torin did likewise. The cramped corridor, at the very least, made it less likely that they would fall down with the bouncing deck. Came down here to her cabin to see what was wrong. I knocked, and she didn't answer. Then I opened the door. She didn't lock it? Torin asked. Listen, shook his head. She never did. Said her door was always open. She also said, Chamblin added, that the whole boat was her quarters. This space was just where she slept. The gnome opened the door to reveal a surprisingly sparse cabin. The bed had sheets made of Cormie's silk, as well as a cotton blanket, but there was nothing else particularly lavish about the space. The pirate queen herself lay on the bed, staring upward with dead black eyes. She barely seems to have aged a day. Torin moved past Listen and Chamblin to inspect the body on the bed. This is what she looked like 20 years ago? he asked. Danthrus nodded. There are a few more lines on her face, but not much. Same raven hair, same dark eyes, same leathery skin. I'm assuming the blue tinge around her mouth is new. Listen nodded. Rat poison. Of which we have a dozen barrels that the entire crew has access to, Chamblin said, so don't even ask about that. Danthrus nodded. Rats were a universal constant in sea travel, and rat poison was a brutal necessity on a seafaring vessel if you didn't want your ship to get overrun. When would she have been poisoned? Har hard to say. Listen rubbed his bearded chin. She eats with the crew, and we all dine together, but those dishes and mugs have long since been cleaned. Torin looked around the cabin. There appear to be no mugs or plates in here, either. Damn. Chamblin frowned. 
She always kept a mug nearby. Sometimes it was ale, sometimes it was fruit juice. Sometimes it was just water, but she always had a drink to hand. All in the same mug? Danvers asked. Listen shook his head. No, she always used a different one when she changed drinks, but she just grabbed whatever mug was clean in the galley. Whoever poisoned her probably used her current mug then and removed it after he died. After she died. Torin looked more closely at the body. I must confess, I expected someone larger. That got a vicious smile out of Listen. Don't let her height fool you, Lieutenant. She may have been shorter than most, but the captain always felt like the tallest person on deck. Nobody messed with her. Not twice, in any case. Chamblin had a smile of his own for that. Those smiles fell at Torin's next words. Well, nobody save whoever killed her. I assume, Danthrus asked, that you didn't put into port anywhere since you found the body? Chamblin was staring daggers at Torin, so Listen replied. We were three days out of Kalbar's Isle when Chamblin found her. The gnome, meanwhile, moved menacingly toward Torin. I won't have the captain speak spoken of with disrespect. Neither respect nor disrespect was intended, Torin said tightly. Danthrus hastily added, Our job here isn't to mourn the Pirate Queen, nor are we here to pass judgment on her, or on anyone else who didn't actually kill her. We are simply attempting to marshal facts in order to find out who is responsible. To that end, Torin said before Chamblin could make a comment, we will need to question your entire crew. I assume everyone is accounted for? Danthrus asked. Listen nodded. We did a nose count and found no one missing. Danthrus nodded. So the killer is still on board. Or doesn't exist. Torin, for the first time since they arrived at the docks, looked pained. Uh, forgive me, but there is a possibility that must be considered. The poisoning could be self-inflicted. Now Shamblin pulled out a dagger and moved toward Torin. Shamblin! Listen yelled. I will not have the captain spoken of this way! Torin held up both hands. Please, Shamblin, I... Shut your shit-sucking mouth! Danthrus said, Chamblin, you have one second to put that away, or we will arrest you for assault on a member of the castle guard. You're welcome to try, half-breed bitch. Chamblin, stop being an idiot. Listen stepped between the quartermaster and Torin. Get out of my way, Listen. This isn't the way to do this. The captain deserves to have her murder solved. Besides, if she saw a squabbling like this... Taking his murderous gaze off Torin, Chamblin regarded Listen with only slightly less anger. She'd have us both swabbing the deck. Listen, nodded. Exactly. Now put the knife away. As Chamblin did so, the sailing master added, Besides, she can't have killed herself. The mug is gone. Someone had to take that away. I'm afraid, Torrent said, that Chamblin's recent actions establish why that disproves nothing. He could have found the body and gotten rid of any evidence that pointed to suicide. I didn't, Chamblin said through gritted teeth. I touched nothing in the room once I realized the captain was dead. I don't suppose, Torin said slowly, I could convince you to swear that on the soul of Dwight. Listen's face fell. Danthrus winced. Chamblin's dagger came back out. How dare you! Before he could move forward, Listen put a restraining hand on Chamblin's shoulder. Easy, Chamblin, he doesn't know. My apologies if I stepped on a custom, Torin said quickly. I've only just learned of this oath. Danthrus said, it's all right. One never requests the oath, Torin. It must be given voluntarily. If it's requested, it's meaningless. Again, my apologies, sir. I spoke out of ignorance of your customs. Torin bowed his head just before the ship bounced from the tide and he stumbled into the bulkhead. To Dethrus's relief, Chamblin notably shifted posture at Torin's use of the word sir, as well as from the respectful tone in her partner's voice. Indeed, Torin was usually far more polite and deferential to witnesses than this, and she was glad to see it making a belated return. Apology accepted, Chamblin said as he sheathed the dagger. As is your word that you remove nothing from this room. Torin said that with another bow of his head. Thank you, Chamblin said. I believe you mentioned something about talking to the crew. Our complement currently numbers 47. Well, he turned to look at the bed. 46 now. Danthrus shot the quartermaster a look. I remember each boat having at least 70 when I was a child. Times change, Chamblin said. Listen, smiled. We've grown more efficient with time, and many of our duties are reduced as our reputation often precedes us, allowing us to perform tasks with efficiency and dispatch. How fortunate for you. 
Torin had returned to the disdainful tone to the Empress's annoyance. She looked at him. 23 each? Torin nodded. Do you have two rooms we might use? Yes, of course. Listen moved toward the door. Come this way. You'll also need to dock the Rising Jewel, Danther said. Chamberlain shook his head. That's out of the question. I wasn't making a request, Chamberlain. Danther turned to face him and loomed over the gnome as much as she could, which was quite a bit as she was tall even by the standards of her father's people, and Chamberlain had the usual lack of height found in gnomes. We need to make sure that nobody leaves the ship. The easiest way to do that is for you to dock, and then we'll have Bonin magic the area around the ship, beyond the influence of the wards but still surrounding them, to keep everyone on board. And also nearby for follow-up interviews. Proving to be utterly unintimidated by Danthris, disappointing her as she prided herself on being able to scare the shit out of people on a regular basis, Shamlin said, I'm sorry, but that just isn't possible. There's too much risk at a port as crowded as Cliff's End. Fine, then we'll leave. Good luck to you. She moved toward the door where Torin was still standing. You can't leave! Listen cried. Watch us. Danthris stopped and turned to face him. The Pirate Queen died at sea. You said you were, what, three days out of Kalvar's Isle? Listen, nodded. That, Torrin said, is well beyond the Castle Guard's jurisdiction. We would be completely within our rights to leave you alone. So if you want our help, you do things our way, Danther said. If you don't, then you may go ahead and sail on with a murderer on your boat. An uncomfortable silence hung over the Pirate Queen's cabin for several seconds. But that Danthris was firm in her demand. If nothing else, she was half convinced that the murderer had already leapt overboard since the nose count, and they'd figure out who it was when that person didn't show up for an interview. In case that didn't happen, though, she wanted the Rising Jewel in dock. Finally, Shamblin said, Sailing Master, listen, would you be so kind as to set sail for the Cliffs End docks? Bring her to the same spot you brought the dinghy, Danther said. That's the dock extension. It's still under construction. It's a bit rough, but... If you can handle the rocks and reef by Sorlin, you can handle that. And it's enough away from the other boats that you should be left alone, especially once Benin and Sorcels leave. If he can, Torin said. Those are quite powerful wards. Then we'll put guards on the Rising Jewel, but I want you in dock and protected, and the murderer kept on board until we find whoever it is. Listen nodded and moved off to carry out Chamblin's order. Torin looked at Chamblin. Take us to where we may do our interviews, please? Chamblin let out a long breath and shook his head. I don't like this. The Pirate Queen's been murdered, Danthor said softly. I don't see how there would be anything to like. That's from Mermaid Precinct, the latest in my fantasy police procedural series. Kind of Law and Order meets Lord of the Rings, as you've seen. Uh, it is available from the fine folks at Eastbeck Books. Uh, for the duration of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, e Eastbeck's ebooks are 99 cents each, so you can sample it for that. Um, Mermaid Precinct is a good jumping on point for the series, as is the first book, Dragon Precinct, or any of them. They're all relatively standalone, so feel free to check them out. You can check me out online at decandido.net, and thank you very much for listening, and please stay safe.